This is so exciting. There's so much to, to talk about. And I want to encourage everybody on the panel that if I ask someone a question and, and you just are burning to jump in, please do. I mean, it's much better if we have a, a dialogue going between all of us. Um, I wanted to have each of you explain what it is you do exactly, especially for the people who are watching this at live stream. I know this is a very informed audience in the room, but there are people who are watching who might not know. And then what brought you personally to the work and what drives you to continue the work? I'll start with you, Tracy. Hi, so I'm Tracy Chow. Um, I'm a software engineer, also a founding advisor with Project Include, which is a nonprofit working with startups on diversity and inclusion. Um, what brought me to diversity work is my experience of being a female engineer and um, feeling not entirely included in the industry. And at the same time, loving the work I do in technology and wanting more people to be a part of it. Was there a specific time that you can remember that's sort of one of those that's kind of seared in you when there's you didn't feel included? There, there are many, many of those. Um, <laughs> can you share one? Mm -hmm. um, wh which ones are appropriate to share? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a number of experiences. Actually, this ties directly into product building when um, I was at various startups, so very early stage, thinking about how we were going to build out these products um, for our community. And I was called upon as the only woman in the room to explain the experiences of all women and how all women would feel about the decisions we were going to make, which was very difficult, and I didn't think I could do that fairly. Um, but feeling like I had the weight of all of my gender um, to uphold, that didn't feel great. Damien, how about you? Hi, everybody. Uh, Damien Uber Campbell, eBay's first chief diversity officer. Uh, within that role, I'm responsible for influencing and executing on a strategy that looks at our workforce, so how we hire and who we hire, our workplace, how does it actually feel when we hire amazing people, um, and then our marketplace, right? We have 170 million buyers across the globe, so how can we be inclusive of the ones we have and the ones we want to have? Um, so in terms of uh, why I'm in the role uh, and, and why I stay, why I'm in the role, and this will feel very meta, um, I give it to God because I didn't think five years ago that I was going to be a chief diversity officer really in this space. Um, why I've stayed in it, I would say, you know, if you believe uh, the saying of those to whom much is given, much mm -hmm. is expected, I've been given a lot. And a lot of people um, advocated for me, people who are from all different backgrounds, um, when I didn't believe in myself. I see this role in many ways as an advocate uh, for people who uh, might not have a voice at the table. Um, I think the other reason, quite honestly, is I think there's a huge wealth creation opportunity that is out here, in tech in particular, mm -hmm. um, for many communities, communities that might have been left out during uh, the financial services boom of Wall Street. And so I just think it's silly for uh, somebody like me to know what the opportunities are out here and not to dedicate my life and my career to making sure that there's a, a level playing field for others. How about for you, Mimi? Um, Mimi Fox Melton, Senior Director of Community Mobilization at Code 2040. Code 2040 is an org that um, works to um, achieve racial equity in the tech industry with a focus here in Silicon Valley. We work primarily with black and Latinx um, computer science majors and entrepreneurs to create pathways into the tech industry. And over the last couple of years, clearly that's not been enough. Um, so we've begun to work deeply with tech companies to help them understand why they can't hire black and Latinx people, why they're not hiring them, and why black and Latinx people are fleeing from their organizations once they do hire them. Um, and really in an effort to break down the systemic barriers to racial equity. So. Um, primarily institutionalized racism within companies. Why this is important to me, um, I see a world where we, where this is achieved. Um, I see it in my mind, I dream about it, I think about it all the time, and I see a path to get there, and it feels like the only appropriate use of my time is to do the work that it takes to, um, you know, start achieving. Um, I also want to share my gender pronouns, um, she, her, hers. And Tash? Hi, my name is Tosh Wilder, and I'm from Paradigm. We're a strategy firm based here in San Francisco that helps organizations become more diverse and inclusive 
And we do this for, through a variety of ways. So we're very data-driven. We're collecting data from organizations, so understanding if there's disparities in how a black or Latinx person moves through the hiring pipeline or experiences the culture or has different opportunities for promotion or advancement. Um, and then also through trainings uh, and a variety of consulting and strategy work. Um, I feel like there's many reasons why this work is important to me, and obviously we all have our journeys for how we got to, to, to where we are sitting on this couch here today and doing the work that we do. Um, I just feel at a very basic level, all of our struggles are implicated in each other. None of us can be free unless all of us are free. And this means within our workplaces, within society, um, and within our own selves, really like interrogating our, our own ways that we're perpetuating uh, oppression um, in our own selves and within society. So I think mm. that um, it's, really, it's really personal and it's also very, um, it's, it's all of our struggle. We're all connected in that way. Uh, and, and I use they, them pronouns. Okay. Tracy, uh, you in 2013 created a way for companies to crowdsource their information about female engineers. When you first did this, first of all, why did you do it? And then what was the reaction? So I wrote this Medium post um, four years ago now and set up this GitHub repository around data because I felt it was so hypocritical of us as a tech industry that's so data-driven to have no data on diversity. It also meant that it wasn't something that we were looking at at all. Um, and it was easy to deny that there was a problem around diversity when there was nothing staring us in the face. Um, and it was actually inspired by hearing Sheryl Sandberg talk at Grace Hopper, which is an annual convention bringing together women in computing. And she made a comment about how the numbers were dropping precipitously of women in tech. Um, and what struck me was that there actually were no numbers, so I didn't know what she was referring to. Um, and it, it seemed like a powerful phrase to throw out there, but I wanted to see actually what the no those numbers were. Um, to start having some benchmarks and also to understand what strategies we were taking that could be successful. Um, at that time, I was working at Pinterest and I wanted to make recommendations to the company about what we could do that would be better around diversity and inclusion. And I looked at companies like Google and Facebook and they had really generous uh, paternity or parental leave policies, uh, paternity and maternity. Um, they had, you know, lots of people going to Grace Hopper, like hundreds of people. These are expensive programs, but there was no way for me to know if they were successful. Um, and so it's hard for me to recommend these things to a startup that was pre-revenue to say we should invest in these really expensive programs without knowing if they're going to be successful. Um, and so put that um, medium post out there, kind of a call to action, didn't actually expect any pickup um, because I could understand that companies were reluctant to share that kind of data. It could potentially look bad. If they didn't know that they were doing well, it could be a bad thing for recruiting, which I think was the, uh, a big fear. Also, legal concerns, um, but was very pleasantly surprised to see people actually start to contribute that data. One of the tenets in journalism is that transparency promotes engagement and trust. Is that the case in Silicon Valley, when you're transparent about your numbers? <laughs> um, I think it helps a little bit. There is some skepticism around the numbers because it feels like companies are still using them as a PR move. Mm. Um, and companies will present the numbers in the light that looks best for them. Um, there's still not full transparency, which is also understandable for companies that are trying to run businesses and can't put all that data out there. Um, but there's some obvious flaws in the data, like not looking at intersectionality. So there will just be the gender cuts and the race and ethnicity cuts, but no intersection. Um, there's no data on retention. And so there's only a very superficial layer of data. And so it doesn't feel like all that trust is quite engendered yet. Tash, let's bring you in because you're the data person. I was going to ask to be brought in. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think both thinking from the outside, looking in. So if you're if you're receiving, if you're part of the public, or, or understanding like what the data, the metrics are for these organizations because they're publishing it, that's one thing. Also thinking about what data means internally. So even going back to how these data are collected um, and what is being communicated to employees about how they're going to be used, and are the options if they're asking demographic data, are they inclusive? 
you just have male and female options? Well, then I don't know what I would answer on that survey. That's not an inclusive survey to begin with if you're trying to understand or track who's in your organization, whether it's a survey or, or your HR data that you're collecting. So starting earlier, thinking about what kinds of data are you collecting? Is it just around demographic representation or are you going into things like feelings of belonging and inclusion? Are you looking at attrition rates and seeing if people are differentially leaving the organization and there might be some demographic data that can help you understand, oh, these are all people from this certain department or all the, the parents are leaving at this stage because we don't have inclusive policies. So I'd say that when we think about data, it can often be very focused on just the external, the demographic data that companies are publishing. And we actually want to go back further and say, what sorts of data are we collecting? Why are we engendering trust and engagement from our employees when we're collecting those data, um, and then how is that going to drive the conversations in a meaningful way forward? Mimi. I think the key here around is around intention also. Like, yeah. companies that are looking for PR cover are, like, these are engineers, right? They're going to collect the data that helps them tell the story they want to tell. And so there's a question that we ask around intention. Do you want to do the deep work? Do you want to do the painful work? Do you want to potentially get lambasted in social media, which is what is going to happen if you find out and share the truth about what's happening in your companies? Because it's shit. It's terrible. Like, unequivocally, no one's doing this well. And so a lot of companies make the choice, no, we, no, we don't want that. And it, the irony of all ironies is that, like, the type of conversation, you know, the 280-character conversation that we see happening now in our discourse is a product of what these very companies have created, right? And then they also are hyper aware that there's no room for nuance in that conversation. So there's not the ability to have complicated, unpacking conversations where mistakes are made and grace is given and learning happens because of the way that we have conversations about race and equity um, in this current climate. So. There's kind of this double-edged sword, right, where you have to make the decision, like, in order to make real change, we're going to have to gather real data and be willing to take the slump in order to come back from it and, and really dig deep. Damien, you are eBay's first chief diversity officer. Yes. Why are you the first? Oh, it's a great question. Um, so I'll answer it in a couple of ways. One is um, eBay was at diversity and inclusion for a long time before... I joined as the chief diversity officer. When I was joining, I heard rumblings of, wow, we're starting from scratch, there's nothing there. And I was asking the same thing of, why has it taken you hiring a chief diversity officer to do this? And as I got there and spent um, my first four months really traveling the globe to all of our offices in the US and outside of the US, I realized there was actually a ton of stuff happening already. Um, and so I, I imagine um, that Part of the, the reason for bringing in a chief diversity officer is to say, so we've got a lot of stuff happening. So we've got stuff happening in our Istanbul office. There's stuff happening in our Seoul office. But there were two things that when I spoke to my CEO, who is the person who created my role, um, when I spoke to him in my interview process, there were two things that I, I think really drove to um, wanting to have a more centralized group. And, and that's the first one is that we were running around doing a bunch of stuff, but there was no cohesive narrative around what we were doing or framework that we could articulate to help people to understand why we were doing it. The other thing was we had done, you know, I think a, a great job at investing, not necessarily tons of progress, but we had done a really good job at investing in conversations around gender and in efforts around gender. But what my CEO said is, help us to expand our definition of diversity and inclusion, not just to um, beyond gender into race and ethnicity, but let's think about even the offices, right, that are outside of headquarters. And if you think about the people who are in small offices that are in Prague somewhere, do they even have the visibility and opportunities for career advancement that somebody who is close to the CEO and close to senior leadership uh, might have? And so I think that there were a number of reasons why um, now was the time. But what it doesn't mean is that eBay hasn't been at this for a long time, because the way that we think about it um, as a company is when you look at our founder, who is an immigrant, um, the entire point of eBay 
was to level the playing field for individuals who maybe for whatever reason couldn't, didn't have the capital to start a brick and mortar business or might have been um, unable to actually get out of their bed to actually go and buy something. And so we were trying to level that playground from the beginning. Having a chief diversity officer is basically us doubling and tripling down on the investment to say, we need something that's a bit more structured to the work that we've already been doing. It's a question for, for you two, because you've both worked at many companies, you know, sort of bold face name companies, Google, Pinterest. Um, what do you see has been a consistent problem across the country, companies that you've worked for? And one that's sort of stubborn, that just, it's hard to move. One big problem is that people in tech want to believe that it's meritocratic and that we are driving forward innovation in every front. Um, and it's true that in, in some aspects we are pushing the envelope and creating really world-changing technologies, but we are also very backwards in diversity. I think that sort of cognitive dissonance is, is, is just there still. Um, and this myth of the meritocracy is very insidious. People still want to believe that the best will rise to the top, and I think some of that is just wanting to believe in a good system that is fair. Um, but also the people who have been successful are invested in continuing to believe that they earned all of their success, um, they deserve to be at the top, they deserve to be present, and the other people who aren't there just don't deserve it. And so dislodging that mindset is going to take a long time. It's cultural change. Um, and I think that is so pervasive. It, it hinders all the other progress we want to make in terms of processes or um, like everything, like all the different tactics that we are trying to implement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would identify two. One is expectations. So when I left Wall Street three and a half years ago to join uh, the technology industry in this work, Part of the thing that made me a bit apprehensive was I said, okay, so tech, I've heard this terminology launch and iterate. Let's just put it out there, let's get it out there quickly. If it's wrong, don't worry, we'll, we'll send out another version of it, we'll fix the bug. These are people you're talking about. You don't need to look any further than the media headlines to see that if you make one wrong move in diversity and inclusion, even with the best intent, people who are in my role as chief diversity officer who are dedicating their lives, you can get blasted in the media for doing that. And so what, what I think part of the problem is, is not that we shouldn't be moving with urgency, we should, but this is not, as I said in our diversity report, this isn't a killer app. There is no one quick solution that's going to solve this overnight. It's going to be, it's going to be a journey, and we're at a certain phase in this journey, and we're going to keep knocking and, and banging on doors, and we're going to keep bringing people into the journey with us, but like, Let's stop thinking that there's one solution that's out there that is just going to change this. By the way, there's a lot of smart people at this. And so if all those smart people together haven't figured out that one killer solution, it should be a message that it's going to take a little bit longer. And I think on all sides, both practitioners like me, as well as people who are in positions of power, who hire people like me and say, hey, okay, fix this overnight, we all need to do a bit of, of expectation managing. That's part of the reason why I was excited about eBay because my CEO again said, I recognize this doesn't happen in six months or a year. So that's, that's one aspect to it. I think the other thing that we're seeing, and I think the, the broader uh, political world context is actually exacerbating this issue, is this is becoming, it's supposed to be about bringing us together. And for a lot of different reasons, what I'm seeing happen in our world, which then obviously spills into companies is, I actually think we're starting to get a bit more divided. I actually think we're starting to cast stereotypes on people who are for diversity, people who are against diversity. And the truth is, that's not actually going to help us. And I don't think that when you come into a company with individuals, some who have lived experiences as underrepresented minorities, some who don't have lived experiences, that we should be shoving these things down people's throats. I actually think it's an, an, an opportunity to bring people into a conversation and to actually talk about it, to make it a safe spot so that if people don't know if they should call me black or African-American or Caribbean, I don't pounce on them 
when they call me African-American, even though I'm half African-American and half Caribbean, but instead it's a learning opportunity. And so my, my fear in terms of what I'm seeing, and again, I think it's fueled by a, a more meta context, is that we're actually becoming more divided. I like to look at individuals in this audience, the people I work with, as human beings. And I like, I like to understand say, that. We'll say, I'm not your learning experience. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not your social experiment. Yeah. I'm just somebody out here trying to <laughs> do my best and be treated fairly. Absolutely, and I think that that's very relevant. And what it doesn't mean, just like, it, so I think that there are gonna be people who wanna stand up and have this conversation, and they're gonna be people who don't, if we're, if we're keeping it real. But the way I think about it is, you know, Rosa Parks didn't have the opportunity to say, I'm not your learning experiment. The leaders across each one of our communities who gave their lives so that all of us could be sitting on the stage didn't really have the opportunity or luxury to say, I'm not your learning experiment. I'm okay with people who say no, but I want to get on board with people who say, I'm not a learning experiment, but I am an agent of change, and if this is what it takes is me giving my shared experience with another individual, then let's come together and do this. Mimi wants to jump in. Damien and I don't agree on much when it comes to racial equity in the tech industry, and I respect you as a professional, you know that, but Rosa Parks did have the opportunity to say that I don't want to be a part of this because the, those folks organized for months and months and months before she sat down in the front of that bus. So I think it's important that we recognize that it takes all types and that these things are very complicated, right? So as a black woman, there are times where I'm willing to answer questions that frustrate me and that irritate me and that Google could easily answer for you. And there are also <laughs> times where I'm not. Um, and I also really, like, it resonates with me that we need to create spaces where hard conversations can be had. But the expectation that those places are going to be safe is erroneous because they're never safe for us. Um, as we've discovered in with what, when e even white women are not safe at the office when it comes to harassment, whether it's sexualized, racialized, or racial sexual harassment. Um, and so what I'm really looking to is how do we create places where we can have these hard conversations where people have the resilience to understand that they are not going to be comfortable. The expectation should not be comfort. However, um, we should all be able, we should build the resiliency to be able to sit in these hard conversations together and do the work that changes, um, that helps us change, right? I think that what I have spotted is that um, their folks in power don't want to give it up. They do not want to relinquish power. And at risk of, um, without the permission of my CEO, I'm going to share with you that Code 2040 is raising a round of capital, $34 million, so that we don't have to continue the fundraising that we do year over year. We're a not-for-profit. And that money is designed to get us to 2020 and achieve full sustainability of our organization. This, thank you, wasn't my idea, but I'll take the thanks. Um, <laughs> The, the challenge here is that $34 million is a hell of a lot of money, and so we have to go to rich people who are almost exclusively rich white men. And w these are men who run companies that are at the forefront of diversity and inclusion chit-chat in the media, and who are posturing, and who are claiming that they are g doing the work, who will not... Inclusion washing, is that what's going on? Listen. <laughs> and who will not write a dollar check, a dollar, who meet with us and who say all the right things. And sometimes, y'all, they say, I don't give a shit about black people. Sometimes they say that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they say all the right things and they will not open up their pocketbook to give. So. And you know why? Because what we're telling them is that we want to change the systems that made them rich, and they don't want that. Mm -hmm. And that is what it's going to take to make real change. 
the people in Istanbul, I respect them and, I, and, I, and I'm gl grateful for all of the work that people of color are doing to change the system, but what we need are white people with money, people with access, to step forward and relinquish a little bit of their power. That is what this is gonna take to make real systems change. They're going to have to will be willing to give some of it up. Let's get some microphones out to the audience. <laughs> While we're getting the microphones out, Tash, is there, out of everything you've heard today, what is, in terms of the data and the way you work with companies, what resonated? What seems to make the most sense and what do you think is a little bit off? Based on the data. Yeah, based on the data, I mean, I think going back to what I opened with, like, we need to have data to create change, to know actually what's happening. Um, Absent of that, we have hunches. We have an organization thinking, oh, it's a pipeline problem. That's why I don't have a lot of diversity in your organization. Mm -hmm. Then we look at the pipeline and we look at the hiring practice and we say, it's not a pipeline problem. You have plenty of people of color in your pipeline. Mm -hmm. It's actually that in your interview process, it's biased. There you mm -hmm. go. Oops, sorry. Like you there don't have enough go. structure That's in it. place. <laughs> and in the absence of having like structural systemic processes that are unbiased, you're not actually going to create a lot of change in your organization. Mm -hmm. Then when people get there, you need to have data to understand how are they doing? And I don't just mean like the numbers on who's there. I mean like how are they feeling? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do they feel safe when they come to work? Yes. If you're a trans person and you're going into an organization, are you being misgendered? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're a non-binary person, do you have a restroom that you can use? Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, this is like has so many implications for many people in terms of disability, in terms of age, in terms of race. Um, so gathering the correct data to be able to tell a story that's, that's comprehensive, that's holistic, and that's really getting at the issues and so that we're not just relying on our hunches about what we think is a problem and then throwing money and energy in that Where direction. the quantitative yeah. meets the qualitative. Hey, yes. let's um, get some, answer, some questions. Hi, I'm Adina. Um, I'm launching a project called Dear Tech People um, on diversity and inclusion. And my question is, earlier in the conversation we talked about um, transparency and kind of where to start with benchmarks. But I think fundamentally there, there seems to be an incentive misalignment when you're thinking about intent of the companies and how to establish that transparency to begin with. How do you guys think about getting the people or the main players to have incentives aligned with diversity and inclusion initiatives? Anyone want to take that one? Um, I'll, I'll take it. Look, I, I think it's different for different companies. So, right, diversity is all about Diversity, right? Like there's difference. I think that there are certain companies that are on a certain journey that have been trying things and they may get to a point where they're like, look, I'm going to hit you where your pockets are. Bottom line, if you don't meet this. Um, there are other companies where because they've started earlier at it, because maybe there's a different culture and a different tone, because maybe the business model is actually set up and there's not a far stretch between um, the business case for diversity and inclusion um, and their actual business model where you might not need those incentives because people get it and they're moving forward on it. So I, I, I don't think that there's a one size fits all. I've seen it work really well in certain places. I've seen it backfire in other places where um, you start attaching incentives to um, diversity and inclusion and what ends up happening is uh, certain managers will feel like, okay, so you're basically punishing me if I don't hire X, mm -hmm. right? And, and while I'm not saying it's not effective to move the numbers, I think one of the things that I heard you know, a little bit earlier is uh, the representation and demographics are, are one thing, but imagine now you have put in place an incentive in a certain company. Again, it works in certain ones, doesn't work in others, but let's say you do it in the wrong company or the wrong organization. Now you have managers who are feeling like, okay, so you've come in and told me who I need to hire. When we talk about that experience that you mentioned, Tosh, right, which is spot on, of the individuals who get in, now you've been hired, what's your actual experience when you're there? Is the manager resentful? Are people looking at you like you were a number? right, or that you were a goal that needed to be met. So I think, to your point earlier, it is a very complex thing. I think it works sometimes. Other times, I don't think it does. Let's take another question. Sure. Um, hi, my name is Beth Andrews Beck. I'm from the Long Term Stock Exchange. My question is, combining the piece earlier about power and how the effective approaches will take it away from people, um, with the questions about these, these transparent stats, it seems like stats are a great way to get outside pressure onto companies. 
but I've also seen that transparency lead to lots of gaming of the systems where designers and project managers get classified as engineering to skew the engineering numbers or uh, where people won't break it down by level. So the diversity among junior engineers makes up for the fact that they have zero diversity among senior engineers. Um, how do you get that effective pressure without creating those incentives to turn it all into PR? What do you think? So one, one example of this that, that drives me crazy is Apple includes its Genius Bar um, members as its tech employees. And, and not to disparage the Genius Bar folks, they have saved my hide a number of times. <laughs> However, my beef with that is that there's no upward mobility for those folks within the actual power and decision-making engineering core at Apple. So there's no path to move from Genius Bar to, you know, like um, software engineering engineer at Apple. Um, and so those numbers are inflated. And, you know, they're retail, so many of them are folks of color, and that, like, skews their numbers as well. Um, so that's just a concrete example. But I feel like yeah. this is one for you. And, or it's one for <laughs> journalists to ask the right kind of questions, I think. We're almost out of time, but I did want to ask you all this one last quick question. If you had to write a headline right now about diversity and inclusion to see where you are, where we are, what would it be? Tracy? I've been thinking about this for a while, and I don't have anything very interesting. Um, <laughs> diversity is still a problem. Diversity is still a problem. <laughs> All right, Damien. Uh, what a time to be alive, comma, what a time to be a chief diversity officer. Okay. <laughs> the Damien's heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, desegregating tech. Okay. And cash. I feel like uh, I'll go a little clickbait on this one and say disrupt fear, because we need disrupt in there, right? Um, <laughs> disrupt, <laughs> disrupt fear for more inclusion. I don't know. I hadn't thought about the last part. So. <laughs> Let's thank our panel. <laughs>